I was like, because you can actually take care of people and probably crush profit if instead of shortcutting, you figured out how to do everything with quality and with effectiveness and with good people and with you know good processes and a good product and good value, you're probably gonna do really, really well. Matt Gottesman, I am so stoked to have you on the Soul Seeker podcast. This has been a long time coming. The first time I came across your work was two years ago, probably in May, when a group of fellow, I was going to call them bandits. I don't know why that word came up, but <laughs> a badass friends came together and we did this uh, virtual summit at the beginning of the pandemic in 2020 called Let's Grow Summits. And you were one of our speakers, but you and I haven't actually had a chance to connect. So here we are two years later. Awesome oh, to connect. That's awesome. Thank you for having me on your show too. Like I, I, I can only imagine how far down the rabbit hole of combos will go. So I'm, I'm happy to be here. Thank you. I'm so stoked. And it's funny because looking at you, hearing you speak like two years ago in a lot of ways was like looking in the mirror and seeing myself for a variety of different reasons. And then as soon as we hopped on the Zoom call, you point out that we have the same mic too. And I'm looking <laughs> at your mic now and be like, yeah, there is a lot here. So for people that aren't familiar with who you are and your work, how do you introduce yourself to those people? Oof. Wow. Like that depends on the circle, I guess, usually. <laughs> it's like, and I always deflect too, because it's like when you're an entrepreneur and you do like a million different things and you have a million different interests. So it's like, oh, I'm, I'm an internet geek. What do you do? And I just like immediately go onto them. But I mean, Same. um, you know, yeah, you know what I mean? Like I, mm -hmm. but uh usually I just, I mean, I tell people like I'm a founder of a couple of companies. Uh, they're all internet based uh, or in a digital agency. And then I say I'm a writer and a podcaster and um, and I usually just kind of go from there because usually that's when either they'll ask questions or I'll deflect to them. So same. Uh, yeah. I, a few years back, probably when my journey first started, I was speaking on stage only in front of like 300 people and it was an entrepreneurial jam and we were like presenting something that we're struggling with. And my thing was, I have this branding, what did I call it? It was like a branding identity crisis or something like that. <laughs> kind of similar to what you're talking about. Like back then I had three different podcasts. I had a media company. I had my main company, all this stuff, and then wrote some books and a YouTube show. It's like, who the hell are you? <laughs> you know? Right. Right. Yeah. And we, and we live in a world where I understand. I get it because I, especially a lot of like my writing on my content uh, online, where I talk a lot about like titleism and credentialism and like, we don't really need these categories that people put us into, but I get that it helps people try to figure out who we are, but it's, it's funny because especially if you're somebody, if you're a creative or an entrepreneur, you're, and you're always, or, and you're into personal growth and spiritual development, all these things like, man, you know, life is evolving like by the day at this point, by the minute. So, you know, it, I think it, it's helpful for some people to get kind of an idea of who we are, but until they sit with us and actually talk a little bit longer, they probably really get to begin to like connect more about like who we really are in this world. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so on that vein, then with yeah. your podcast, what are you about on your podcast? Yeah. So I have a podcast called the hustle sold separately, not hustle, like hustle culture, but when it started about six years ago and I was growing on social media, I said I was never going to do a podcast. That's the, mm -hmm. the irony is that like, I always say you can't run from what's for you, nor can you chase what isn't right. And mm -hmm. I literally didn't think I was going to do a podcast. Uh, my audience kept asking for it. I'm like, I'm not going to do a podcast. And then I was helping out a studio in town uh, with some other people and then also their, their digital stuff. And they're like, do a podcast. I'm like, I'm not going to do a podcast. <laughs> and, then, and they just kept saying it to me. And then one day I'm like, you know what? I felt it come through to me. I was like, let's do it. And, you know, decide on the name hustle sold separately. Like the dream is free, but like anything in your life, you're going to have to, you know, take ownership and really get into the root of understanding who you are within those things. You're going to have to do the work, right? We can't escape good work, focused work, intentional work on things. And so the idea was, I knew that if, the podcast. I didn't want to be like every other podcast at the time. There's only there was only seventy thousand podcasts back then. By the way, so it's crazy now, right? When you're used to saying like, "Oh, a podcast, that's normal." Wait, back when then, did there, you start your podcast? It was in 2016, 15, 16. Oh, that so, was early. Yeah, yeah. So when you think yeah. about, it, I mean, it it well, what happened was, I mean, it went from like seventy thousand to like the following year, one hundred fifty thousand to the following year, one point five million. <laughs> like you saw a spike 
Like it was crazy. So it's been interesting to watch the evolution of that. And um, I knew that I wanted to not focus on end success or even the word success as it pertains to the way society defines, you know, here's all of these people here, you know, and this is what success looks like. And let's just talk about only their accomplishments. I really wanted to humanize the creative journey and the entrepreneurial journey. Like, what are you learning about yourself? And like, let's connect the audience all of ourselves to each other of like, oh, wow, like I've gone through that. Oh, I'm going through that. Like we're, we're not so different anymore. You're not on this pedestal and this person's just the listener. And you can start to get more of a, a connection between, you know, the creatives, the creatives in the world and the, and the entrepreneurs or the, the, the misfits, if you will, like people were just the like misfits. Doing their, there, that's the word you were looking for earlier, right? Yeah, totally you know? not bandits. Yeah. Yeah. Misfits. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah. So that's, I also didn't focus, like I know a lot of podcasts would focus on, well, if you're a marketing podcast, you get all the marketers. And if you're mm -hmm. a spiritual podcast, you get all the spiritual people. And like, and I totally get having a theme for sure. I wanted to go wide in discipline and narrow niche in character. Mm. So I wanted the, the character to be like the self-awareness, the ability to be open about you know, who they are, who they're becoming, what they're learning and, and how they're doing things. Um, but across different disciplines to show everybody like, Hey, you don't, you know, you can be a music producer and you could be like a mixed medium artist and you could be a digital marketer or a healer or a CEO or a fashion designer. Like they're all different disciplines, but they're willing to talk about the journey of who they are or who they're becoming and what they're learning about themselves. And and it really just humanizes and creates a, a wider, vast audience of like, huh, you know, I don't want to become a fashion designer, but like really cool to hear how that, what that person's going through. I'm like, and it's interesting how they're in a different industry, but I can kind of relate to like what they're going through. And I wanted more of that connection. No, I love that. That's so important. That's going deep about what people are about, right? You know, yeah. and who they are and um, really what makes them tick. And one thing that's interesting too, about what you mentioned with success is the cliche is true. You know, it's uh, I'm blanking on it, but the journey is the destination. Yes. I think that's it. Yeah. And that's really my story yeah. of like chasing success, getting these goals to complete, to create another goal. And then finally through ayahuasca, like you mentioned before we, uh, hit record, I realized that I was just addicted to chasing this uh, dopamine and doing things that I thought I was supposed to be doing versus like truly finding that why, like I was into Simon Sinek and, you know, find your why and start with why and all that type of stuff. But it's layers deeper than that, yeah. you know, because it's so easy to be on the surface of like, oh, I'm passionate about this and this is my why I drive this business or whatever it is. But you got to go a few more layers deeper, you know? Oh, yeah. There's always more layers. And it's cool that you mentioned like that dopamine hit. It's interesting, the, especially in a, in a season I'm in where I'm constantly wanting to ground and practice solely in the intuition only when I say that, because like, when we, we make a lot of decisions, intuition is basically like you're feeling into your soul, right? And there isn't necessarily a data point or a metric, you know, and I know Dr. Joe Dispenza had talked about that at one point where, um, and I'm paraphrasing a lot, but like, it's sort of like, when you make a gut feeling, you go off of your gut feeling, you're going off like a soul blueprint, like, no, this just feels right. Well, what happens is a lot of people will say something like, well, what's going to happen if this, and what about that? And what about this? And it's like, well, I'm going off of my soul's like GPS. I, I'm not going off of, of yours. So like, I can automatically already see how that, you know, you're bringing up like, where's the data? Where's the data? I need data. And what does the body also do as an individual is it basically wants to stay doing what it already knows. So every decision that we make usually, right, is it up until that point, we're making certain decisions and we have outcomes and those outcomes produce data and the nervous system records them as memories. And now we're, that's how we're like operating. Even if it's like, Oh, I, I did this with the company and I made X money. And now I know if I tweak these things, I can make more and I could do these. And you know, we're, we're always using kind of data, but imagine if you're making decisions off of like just your, your gut instinct, like your, or your intuition. Right. Mm. And we're dealing with so much uncertainty that the body has to get used to uncertainty 
because otherwise it kind of glitches out a little bit, right? Because it's like, wait, 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 no, no, no. I, I know an answer over here. You're throwing me into like, you know, no answers over here. Like, I don't know how to react. I don't know what to do. And if we can keep practicing that more and more and more, we'll trust ourselves more in any given situation. We'll trust the feeling that we have, or we can make decisions faster, you know, because we're like, if we practice it enough, uncertainty won't scare us. Mm -hmm. We'll actually be like, no, no, no. Like my intuition, you know, feels this way. And, and then um, to add to that, somebody asked me the other day, like, how do you practice that? And I said, practice doing the opposite. So like when you feel an answer come in like that, if it's like, that's a no, and you don't really know you want to go with it, play around with it a little bit, like test it as a theory or a hypothesis and start to kind of move in the opposite direction. Like, you know, your, your gut's telling you like, mm, don't do that business deal or don't do this. Start to kind of try to, to maybe do it and see <laughs> if like you're already getting signals and inputs that like, mm, there's resistance here or there's some things that don't seem aligned. Cool. Now you can stop, you know? So it's like a, a random tangent, if you will, but I just noticing that practicing that, like being comfortable with the uncertainty and really trusting yourself. Cause you know, like we all, we all can feel it. We know, we know what we need to do. You know, we really do. And even it using discernment with the intuition is uh, very tricky to your point. Right. And, and that's why I like what you're saying in terms of like doing the opposite and maybe right. not fully commit, but you can right. see if those like obstacles come in and that's like, Oh, I'm being guided to go a different path. This, uh, whereas if that is the path that you're quote unquote supposed to take, you're going to be more set up and more guided and everything's just going to fall into place. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, and that's why we see it all the time, whether we're aware of it or not. Like you ever detoured, quote unquote, I mean, what is a detour? But have you ever kind of, you know, just maybe gone the opposite direction of maybe some of the things you kind of knew you should, you, you, you felt more called to do, but you went in the opposite direction. And isn't it funny how sometimes you end up somehow magnetically pulled back <laughs> to where you first started right. on a couple of different things. We're like, huh, I'm back here again. Like that always felt right to do this. And now suddenly I'm back where an opportunity came up or it kind of, you know, um, we're always like one, we can veer off and we're always like one decision like that, ready to just go right back to where we probably know. But sometimes we have to veer off. And I think that's life, right? Because it's what kind of that contrast allows us to figure out what does actually really feel right for us and what's just going to be a really great ride and experience <laughs> regardless of the outcome, you know? Definitely. Yeah, no, that resonates. So in terms of business, uh, yeah. because I know you work with, I believe you work with freelancers a lot, but do you have like a team, like employees yeah. as well? How big is your team? Yeah, we're about six to seven people at this point. We have some freelancers, the freelancers that have a little bit more of a built out brand. Um, they've got, they're usually at capacity with their clients. So usually it's small businesses mm -hmm. um, that range in there from like maybe 300,000 a year in revenue to 300 all the way up to about you know, five to 8 million, just depending on where they're at. Um, so I'm, I'm a digital native, meaning like I, I've been, I grew up with the internet since like I was a kid, like 95 AOL chat rooms, all that stuff. And I knew the internet was going to be something, but like at the same time, uh, that's hard to explain in college and other places where they're like, well, I don't really see it. Like, you know, <laughs> where they're yeah. like, how are we going to use this for business? And I'm like, it's going to be an interesting ride, you know? And, um, and so I had done a lot of different aspects of the digital world, whether, you know, you're talking about advertising or an, your general marketing or your branding or the coding or the backend systems or the you know, software or the heart, like all of the different things. And in more recent years, first, I solved the problem for me, which was as a creative and an entrepreneur, we don't often think about systems and um, they don't sound sexy. They, it's not like, you know, but as in everything in life, like when we start to apply some disciplines to certain areas, we can manage that, which we want to grow more of. Right. Mm -hmm. And so with that, I, I knew of a, a gal that, um, I trusted wholeheartedly from a friend of mine who had passed, uh, prematurely, but she used to run his business. And I said, Hey, I hear like the systems whiz. I'm like, I have all this stuff that I'm doing as an entrepreneur. I've got all of these, you know, things going on from client work to my own media to everything. I need to sort it out. Like I need to actually like create systems so I can start valuing my time more mm -hmm. because I'm, if we don't take care of time that hit me really hard because my father um, who passed in 2019 was like my best friend and mentor mm -hmm. in some, in a lot of ways, it just got me thinking about time differently in a whole other capacity. And 
So that led me down this, this path of like, really, how do we optimize our time? And what I found within the, both the digital realm and with entrepreneurship or small business or in general is that if we don't manage time and we don't manage how we're systematically providing our service or our value to the world, we're going to run, we're, we're going to almost ruin sometimes our passion, right? You ever like love what you do, but then all of a sudden you start to not love what you do because you're like, this is a lot. Like I, like I'm, I'm getting burnt out. Um, or in general, you, you, you just, you, the overwhelm can become so much. And as I was getting it done for me, um, the gal, uh, Ali, she was like, Hey, um, what are you do with clients? What are you going to do with, you know, uh, the consultancy? And I was like, I don't know. And she goes, why don't you turn it into an agency? You know, I, I fought that at first, by the way, too. I was like, no, no, no. I used, cause I used to work brand side uh, for like big brands as a consultant auditing agencies. I was like, no, I know how they work. And she's like, well, why don't you do it differently? I was like, that's fair. So I said, let's focus on systems. Like let's help people with their sales and their marketing automations and um, you know, and all these, you know, the funnels and all the stuff that you see everybody online doing. I'm like, I've kind of dissected everybody's. And I also see, you know, online people have a rep and people get burned and all this other stuff. And I'm like, for us, it's just kind of what we've grew up with. So like, let's just help people in these areas. And, um, you know, and so we, you know, we have a head of dev and design we have a, you know, systems integration specialist, you know, so it's like a, a nimble team that just, just became like family. And, um, we just started helping, you know, all these, these businesses, but it, it was cool because it was a lot of like intentional brands or, you know, people trying to, well, I always say do more of what they love at scale. It's like our tagline. It's like, how do you get people to like, Hey, I want to focus on providing the value, but I need help. And right. So exactly. Cool. You got to double down your strengths and outsource for the weaknesses, you know, that's it right there. Yeah. All of us do. All of us do. Exactly. It's not just entrepreneurs. It's your employee, everyone, like everyone. no one should be working in an area that isn't their expertise and expected to uh, pick up uh, jobs from other people, given yeah. the state of the great resignation and everything else, you know? Yeah. Talk so. about that, right. Timing on that. You know, yeah. I, I, I think business as a whole is, everything's opened up. I think you're seeing the transparency all across the board. I saw it for years. I'm sure you did too, but like, right. Yeah. Right. Well, I, I always... just did a podcast with a um, gentleman's name's Scott shoot. You might uh, have heard his name, name, but yeah, yeah. He was head of mindfulness at LinkedIn and it was really yeah. interesting picking his brain to hear how that started and how recent it only started in 2018 that uh, he developed the mindfulness program for uh -huh. all of LinkedIn. And, you know, I say only because like you know, I'm from Silicon Valley and I remember the Salesforce towers going up probably a few years earlier than that. They had the meditation areas and mm -hmm. Google is well known for having different things like that. But it definitely since the pandemic now, this is just everyone is wanting to really what's the word I'm looking for? Like do it versus talk about it. It's yeah. seemed like before it was more like, Oh, we care about our employees. You know, right. like we have mindfulness. Now it seems like hopefully they actually care, you know? Right. It's a, it's a big deal. I, um, I often find myself at the intersection uh, talking about business and spirituality mm. because, you know, somebody asked me, they're like, there's such different aspects. I'm like, are they? I was right. like, because when you really think about like the, at the, the core fundamental, the greater relationship we really have with ourself, our, 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 our inner self, our, our mind, our body, our soul, our understanding, our um, emotional intelligence, our, you know, our connection, our heart, um, our truth, like honesty, speaking from a very deep rooted, honest place, what's that going to do in business? You know? And um, I just, I had seen once I, the more personal development and spiritual work I did, it started to make sense about what I saw all those years ago in business that I used to take personal or like, I, cause I saw like as a, as a consultant to like a lot of big businesses, you'd see a lot of behavior that I'm like, how did you get this job? Or like, right. you know, or like, oh, I did like, or uh, there were so many different times I did really great work. And then all of a sudden they're like, yeah, you're, uh, we're not going to renew your contract. We're not going to this. I'm like, but I just made you a lot of money. Like, didn't we just do really well? Like I was so naive, you know, mm -hmm. um, in a, in a healthy way, but like I was naive and I'm like, I don't understand. Like I thought I did everything right. And then I started to realize, Oh, they're having worthiness issues. They're having value issues. They're worried about losing their job. They're worried about you showing them up. 
They're worried about, um, you know, uh, them being found out, whether they're good enough for their role. Um, they're, you know, certain things that they didn't want to enact or, or put in, not all brands, I actually learned some really great things from some really great companies. But I saw so much of the behavioral side of individuals within corporate America. I don't know dealt with like American companies, but like for most of the part. Um, and it was just interesting to see what was happening with the individual person. And yet some of them were in very high roles and I just didn't understand it where I would take it personally. And then all these years later now I don't, and I'm like, Oh wow. Like you can understand more even where they're coming from and you can either disarm them or like, you know, cut it off like right away and be like, Hey, we're, we're going to lean in. We're going to have this conversation. Like, cause that you're having a, you know, you're having a moment. I'm not like, I don't allow to be spoken to that way, but like, I love you. We're going to sit here and we're going to talk about it. Like what's going on, you know? Mm -hmm. So the more I think we really understand about ourselves, the greater we can do in business in like helping having the right people in the right places and helping you understand how we can better with our customers and, you know, and just take care of everybody. We can actually have win, win, win. It doesn't have to be like the old paradigm of like somebody wins and somebody loses and it's got to be cutthroat. And <laughs> I've never believed in it being that way ever. So. Yeah, that resonates a ton. In my recent book, I talk about uh, mental health over profits and impact over dollars. And it's been something that I've seen in myself and experienced uh, within others as well. But I've been that toxic leader, you know, um, where I would just get be short sighted and lose my cool for on behalf of my clients. If it was like a vendor, I will, that wasn't, didn't live up to their word. And then I would have to take responsibility would right. fall on us. And then I've lost plenty of big clients because of things like that. Even when you take responsibility and it's not your fault. And then, you right. know, how, yeah, it, <laughs> there's, yeah, that's a whole nother thing too. But the whole thing is like, when we put more pressure, whether it to it's to perform for our customers and clients, our vendors or our employees, wherever it is, it's like, that's when we need to zoom out because we're not thinking about the impact we're making in the trickle effect. You know, it's, um, I wish more leaders would really think about that and bring that in. And yeah, I agree that spirituality and business do have a place to be spoken in the same sentence, but right now it is a little, uh, stigmatized, a little taboo, but it right, feels like right. we're, is it right? Of course, you know, completely yeah. opposite things too, in a lot of ways you know so yeah absolutely and we don't want to bring like religion and dogma and uh all these type of things in but just like simple practices and if yeah. we can trojan horse uh, trojan horse it through uh mindfulness then sure why not right yeah. absolutely that well put like if we can trojan horse it a little bit because you know yeah when i say spirituality that the, the hard part is like i think there's you get so many different aspects of like are you talking about any particular religion? Are you talking about a practice? Are you talking about meditation? Are you talking about like all these different things? And it's like, at the core, like you said, the the mindfulness, and then the connection to the heart and the soul, like the, the understanding of, you know, how we fundamentally behave and who we are and having a relationship with ourselves is going to drastically change. And you brought up mental health. Think about how you said mental health over profit. I wrote that down. I was like, yeah, and higher, greater mental health and higher emotional intelligence will crush your profits all day long. Like you will have phenomenal sure. profits. And they, they've seen this in conscious capitalism. Um, so there's like conscious capitalism groups uh, in around the, the country they have like as an organization where they found that the more you take care of your people, their well-being, your, you know, their team, the more you take care of the people you serve for your products and services, um, the more you're just taking the entire ecosphere into consideration of your character and your behavior and your delivery and your quality and all of these great things, the higher the retention customers, the higher retention of your staff, the higher the profits, you know, and recurring purchases. I mean, doing good is good. Like it's actually, it's <laughs> yeah. like, it's, it, but, it, but it, it used to crack me up because I thought I was weird for a long time with like, businesses always just make it be like, it's got to be cutthroat. It's got to be this. It's got to be that. I'm like, I'm sorry. I disagree. I'm not sorry. I disagree with that. I was like, cause you can actually take care of people and probably crush profit. If instead of shortcutting, you figured out how to do everything with quality and with effectiveness 
and with good people and with you know good processes and a good product and good value, you're probably going to do really, really well. That just means that you have to actually be accountable for all these different things versus kind of the shortcutting and the titleism and credentialism that everybody was like, oh, I went to this school and father knows this person. So they'll put me into this role. And, you know, now I'm in this position and no, oh, I'm ahead of this department. And, you know, I've seen like people who are head of marketing departments, but they work for fortune 50 companies that are always in the black. And I'm like, so you guys are naturally doing well every year. And you're just kind of managing the status quo. Cause again, I had to learn that because I would bring up all these different things. I'm like, oh, we could do this and we could do that. They're like, no, 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 no. That would require us tracking everything. And I'm like, yeah. And then we can actually make more money. They're like, no, we just need to make sure that the agencies are all just doing everything they're supposed to be doing in the billboards and the magazines and we'll be okay. And I started to realize, I'm like, oh, wow. Cause you as a company already have brand recognition. So you're already making your 10 to 15, 20% in profit a year. And as long as you spend your marketing dollars and you're, you know, you're out there and you're managing the status quo and nothing's rocking the ship, you have job security. And mm -hmm. it took me, it took me to like see some, not everybody, but I saw that. I'm like, oh shit, the system's rigged. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so like, you know, I didn't know that I haven't put that together. So thank you for sharing that. What, what I, um, I went to MBA school and I didn't know this either. So and um, so marketing departments will have like a budget, right? And, and by the way, this is, I don't think this is all companies, but um, marketing departments will have like a budget, let's say $100 million. Finance department, typically marketing and finance don't get along, but you think that they would. Because if you are marketing effectively, you're making more money. And if you're making more money, the finance is like, thank you. You guys are making us more money we have more to count and we can you know grow the business the bottom line but why they started to not like each other is because marketing will sometimes waste dollars and the finance department will basically say um we're going to take away whatever dollars you don't use by the end of the year so if out of the 100 million you only use 80 we're taking that 20 million away from you well, what does the marketing department do we've got to spend it somewhere <laughs> we don't even care how we just have to spend it because we don't want to lose the budget for next year right and so i would see this and then I'd say, oh, well, you can spend it on this and that. Like, oh, no, no, we spend our money all these different places. And I'm like, yeah, but like, that's traditional marketing. There's nothing wrong with it. But like, you can't track it. I, you can't figure out like conversion rates, like, you know, all the digital stuff that I was into. And it was weird because they're like, yeah, no, that's fine. As long as, you know, it looks good. And, and I was like, and so I, I started to see, I'm like, so you want to maintain the way things are, because if you're already in the black, you kind of look like everything's okay. And you're just here to kind of spend the money and make sure that, the projects that get done, get done. Mm -hmm. And I started to connect the dots and I'm like, oh, wow. Like, because you have to spend the, the budget, you look good because, well, the company's just doing well. I mean, it's, you know, it's Nabisco or it's like Johnson. I don't want to use a, it's, it's a whatever company, right. Yeah. You know, whoever that they're with a big brand. Um, and it was just fascinating to watch. And I realized like, okay, um, you know, businesses get really big. And sometimes I think, um, there's not enough of that communication or that like innovation or growth or, you know, or people don't want to change or adapt, you know? So I get that too. Yeah. That's, it's really fascinating. And it brings up my days, uh, my still my main business that I've been working on transitioning out of for three years, but it's just, <laughs> You know, anyways, it's called Swagworks. We do swag. So it's very similar to that where, you know, an admin calls up and it's like, we got the lose it or use it or lose it budget. And I'm like, yeah. ching, sure, I'll process that, you know, not really right. questioning it. Um, but yeah, that makes sense. And I, I want to get into like your personal stories and like yeah. transformation. But before we do, last thing on spirituality and business, you know, there's the idea of the archetypal energy of the feminine and masculine, which yes. in my own talks that I'm giving to corporate, I'm just saying yin and yang because I don't want to open up that. Uh, I know. I can't work. <laughs> you know what I mean? I know what you mean. Yeah. 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 For yeah. sure. So, with that said, we do realize that the yang energy is due all this type of stuff like calendaring, like what you mentioned. You also mentioned intuition, which would be the yin. So in terms of like actually getting things done, one thing I've seen across the board and people in spirituality is uh, so many people spiritually bypass, whether it's in personal life or in business situations. But a lot of times, 
they it seems like a lot of people can't actually get things done because they want to be so in intuition and flow and i come from the opposite where i was so much in my masculine in the yang energy of do achieve where you know I've learned to be in flow and intuition. And now I'm kind of coming back and finding this flow. And that's what my book's about in the practice of soul life balance. But I'm curious to hear from you since you've touched on both like calendaring and also intuition. How do you kind of bridge the gap between the two energetics when it comes to business? You know, I had heard some time ago about, you know, the energies and, you know, the, the masculine and feminine that's in all of us as an energy which is also going to be divided up into two sides of the body, masculine on the right, feminine on the left, which makes sense where the heart is, right? And interestingly, you know, the the masculine or the yang, you know, had, uh, which I didn't know, it was the, which is the yin, which is the yang. So thank you for that, by the way. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that ability to, the warrior, the ability to execute, the ability to make things happen and, you know, uh, and protect and provide and, and to just to just move to to create and to build without that feminine the heart the truth like intention grounding ourselves from the day to day of you know dealing with the world at large or business at large or anything really like being on the battlefield of life what grounds us at the end of the day so we don't lose ourselves so we don't get hardened by the process the heart hmm. you know there's a I first heard this in Judaism, but I've heard it in, in other spiritual, like in other uh, religions and spirituality and things like that. But um, that the fastest way to the to the man, to the masculine is through the woman, the feminine, the heart, right? Because mm -hmm. the soul is so open and the heart is where, you know, honesty, right? To, to remind ourselves of like, of truth when we're, you know, when we can get hardened from the battlefield, if you will, right, of, of life, you know, and, it, and it's all of us, so we can all experience that all people can experience that. So um, I like the idea of kind of like what you said, like, well, there's this balance where, look, things cannot always be in flow, but right. we can always be in a, a state like we can work constantly on how we handle those things that come in, right. Mm -hmm. And um, by that's why if we focus so heavily on, you know, our own practices that keep us grounded, keep us rooted, keep us feeling in our alignment, the things that are just naturally innately healthy for ourselves. Well, yes, things come in, you're able to kind of like manage them like better, you're clear, you're intentional, you're honest, you're, you know, uh, good emotional intelligence, great mental well being, which by the way, all these things, good nutrition, movement, exercise, um, you know, meditation, prayer, gratitude, like all the healthy activities we can do for ourselves that allow us that when we're, you know, having to manage the world at large, um, we're able to move accordingly, not reactionary, right? Because that's, I think that's really what we're seeing anyways, glow on the macro scales, everybody's reacting to everything right now. And, um, you know, how can we solve that? at the individual level, at the micro level, you know, if I understood more about myself and what I'm really needing and wanting and knowing and, and having and all these things. So, uh, yeah. So I think that that balance of, uh, understanding like, Hey, I want to, um, what, what's the expression? Um, things don't get easier. You just get better. Mm. Right. And, and it's an interesting thing that I constantly notice how, I remember things that used to seem 20 years ago, so difficult, you know, but we're, you know, we're kids and you, you think it's going to be difficult and it seems like the, the worst thing that could ever happen. And now you look back and you're like, oh, like I can handle way harder things than that. Yeah. Because you were on the battlefield of life. Like, you know, you, you've been experiencing life and figuring out yourself more, or I hope you've been figuring out yourself more, you know, and um, you're now able to, like use both energies, like, Hey, where can I assert myself to um, grow and build and create? And where can I um, pull back and reflect and understand and feel and, um, you know, uh, um, not hardened, but like, you know, um, ground in, in honesty and humility and, um, and humbleness. And so, yeah, it's like, they're constantly working with each other, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. And a lot of that kind of manifests in the way we communicate with our team and whatnot. And yeah. that's, it, it's, it's funny too. One of the things I was thinking is if we were in 
the out of balance feminine or yin in terms of bringing it into business, what would that look like? Oh, okay. So we can we have a meeting on our calendar, but then we're like two minutes before, nah, I don't, I don't feel like it. I'm not in flow right now. Like I, I, this feels more, my intuition's telling me to do like that wouldn't work either, you know? And a hundred percent. Yeah. So anyways, transitioning out of this, yeah. uh, thank you for all of the, the wise words and uh, takes on spirituality and business. That's always a fun conversation. Now this podcast soul seeker started with my ayahuasca journey. After I did ayahuasca in 2019, I was like deep dive rabbit hole blinders on everything I want to know is just going deep, deep, deep. And this whole podcast has been great. And we've been talking about a lot of good things that really matter, but now to go a little bit deeper on your story, you mentioned that you did Aya the first time was 2018. Uh-huh. Yep. So uh, walk us through that. Yeah. I mean, uh, I thought I can, I mean, I thought it was, I thought it was pretty good. Um, you know, I, my may not have been as intense as others, um, uh, but I did also do the, the, um, mushroom tea in 2020. So I can, <laughs> I can definitely expand on that. That was much more vivid. Um, but I, you know, going back to about 2012 really started just on a spiritual personal development growth trajectory. I was raised around it. Um, it was very prevalent in my home. Uh, my my mother was a very much a, a spiritual person who was always like, you know, oh, there's a problem here. Read this book, or like, let's 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 pray on it. Let's let's uh, let's meditate on it. Let's you know. She was always very um, just spiritual, you know, very in nature. And uh, I, you know, I ran into a series of um, just events that seemed so unexplicable and and surrendering. I didn't know what to do. And so it led me to my parents' rabbi to start. And it's like, I don't know what to do, you know? And he's like, what's going on? I'm like, my soul hurts. Mm. <laughs> and he's just like, that's tough. He's like, but solvable. And I said, all right. And he goes, well, you know, it's all about the journey of who you are and the char your character. He's like, you know, uh, I'm not going to give you some spiel about religion and, and all this stuff. He's like, it's about you. Like, who are you? And like, what's going on inside? And like, what's your purpose? Like, what's, he's like, and it's, and it's a tough sometimes journey because everybody wants to know what their purpose is, but you have to kind of get to know yourself and your character. Right. And so that led down to a series of um, very interesting journeys. Um, I, I was there because I was also going through a divorce and I lost a lot of diff like business deals that I thought I had done well, everything on the outside looked really good. And all of a sudden I was like feeling like I was, I felt at the time, like I was left with nothing and I didn't want to point my finger anywhere because it doesn't matter if other people cause you something because you're still in that situation so whatever you did that was a series of decisions or you know choices you still were a part of that experience somehow you got there and so i really was doing very personal reflection of like who's this guy in the mirror like who am i as a man who am i if i want to be you know a husband again one day and i do and um, who am I as a, um, you know, in, in service to the world or at least to my community? I want to know all these things. So it led me to rabbis, which then eventually led me to like wanting to see other like modalities as well too, like, you know, healers and uh, shamans and, uh, you know, in different countries, <laughs> you know, to um, eventually I, I tried Iowa Oscar only one time in 2018. And, and it was really, it was really great. I didn't uh, have to do, I think the, the full round, the double round or anything like that. I was, I was pretty, um, uh, I was pretty lit up <laughs> from just the first round. And um, that uh, I just, I felt uh, for me, that experience was very, um, um, it removed layers uh, of that, um, we sometimes, I think our mind can throw so many extra things in there that aren't even there. It's just from perception or narratives or whatever we might do. And it just started to remove a lot of that out. And it felt much more like just connected for me. I mean, I know everybody has a different eye experience. Some purge the brains out and, <laughs> you know, do all these things I didn't. Um, and it wasn't until then I did the tea, um, a mushroom tea with like a, a heroic dose um, in 2020 that was wild. Like, mm -hmm. so, um, 
what happened there, which was very interesting for me, and I don't mind talking about it, but um, you know, it's it basically lasts for about six hours. And um, the first hour and a half is kind of where, you know, the thick of it really comes from before you start to kind of emerge out into the light, you know. Um, what I had noticed for me, um, it, it was a very spiritual, very, very soulful experience. I basically started to see the interaction that I had had with all of like a lot of just different random people and experiences throughout my life at a soul level, not the human level. What do I mean by that? We're human. So we have behaviors and sometimes we act in ways that are, are all across the board. Some are very loving, some are not so loving. And we, we, we act in all these different manners. And as humans receiving, we sometimes take those different things and we turn them into narratives and we turn them into different like uh, experiences that sometimes can hinder us or slow us down or we get into trauma or whatever it might be. I actually could see their soul interaction with me, which is mm. so wild to think about. Meaning it's like, you could see like a, a boss that you didn't really uh, like, but I could see at the soul level, I'm like, oh, wow, we're like, were they helping me? Like I started to actually see, oh, wait a minute, their role was specifically to do something like this, which then created this thing to happen, which created this thing to happen. I actually saw at a soul level, all these interactions of people good and sometimes not as much fun um, that they're all, all actually helping. And it really changed my entire like viewpoint of, you know, I was like, did I put you there? Like I almost kind of, and, and then I'm having this conversation with this divine feminine energy. And she's like, do you get it? And I'm like, do I get what? She's like, look at like your path. Like everybody was serving a purpose. They all were. And I was like, did I put that there? And she's like, you created all of it. We all do that. That's how it works. And I was like, did I, and I started to realize, I'm like, did I create that in essence of like, how do we get home? We need people to help us on the way. We need experiences to help us along the way. And so I started to see like this path of all these different experiences of people that I was like, oh shit, like they were helping me all along. And it's so, it would be so easy to not think that, especially if people were very difficult or you went through very difficult situations to easily be hardened from it. And so you realize like, oh my God, it was just helping me remind me more of who I am and actually help me like wake further up into like my, where I'm, where I'm heading, where I'm going, you know? And so it was really fascinating to actually like look at all of that and even see like people who even sacrifice for you on the outside, you think they're like, they're rejecting you or they're this or that. Did you, have, and, and I'm having this conversation with this like feminine energy. It's like, did you ever stop to think that they were actually helping you, that they were sacrificing for you? That instead of like taking what they wanted, they actually like had to step aside because you were meant for more or greater. And it was like, you, I just, I felt all of a sudden this like immense gratitude and amount of respect for everybody regardless of the interaction. And it was, it was just, it was so intense because I can actually feel the soul intention versus like the, you know, the human interaction that we had with them that really like, just like blew everything open for me because I started to realize I'm like, oh, wow. Like you can't take anything personally. And I get that it would be easy to do so, but you can't because like, you really don't even know what's actually happening and how like they might actually be helping you in some capacity. And if you don't like take what they're saying so personally and you ground more in like, you know, the comfort of knowing who you already are, you can kind of just be like, did I put you there? <laughs> you know, like I'd even end up in these situations where I like look at people, like when they're like projecting or doing something, I'm like, I feel like I put you there to like remind me something, <laughs> you know? And I, I, I started taking less like personally and realizing also that a lot of what we see that's contrasting isn't meant to hurt us. It's meant to remind us more of who we already really are. And that really hit me differently because I realized when you see somebody projecting or they're really rough or they're really like, you know, just whatever they are to you, it doesn't mean that you have to take that on. In fact, if anything, it can remind you of like, why doesn't this feel good? Oh, cause I'm not that. And if I know that I'm not that, oh, wow. Like I respect that. I'm not that. Wow. I love that. I'm not that. Oh shit. Now I know how to actually really um, like 
you know, feel and honor and respect more of what I already am. Mm -hmm. But it's so easy to take on the energy somebody else gives us and start to think that we're that. No, we're not that. The contrast is to remind you to be grateful for that which you already are, not that. And it was really, that just, it just changed me so much from that experience. And yeah, like it changed me in life and in business and, you know, uh, and it's, it's been an interesting ride. <laughs> so hopefully that made sense. I can see that. Thank you for sharing, brother. And yeah, no, yeah. that makes a ton of sense. And I think that's uh, a similar experience that a lot of us have. And thank you for speaking on the integration, the practical yeah. application after the fact, because that's one of the things I wanted to mention as well. Like once you have that type of experience, then you're able to start applying that into your daily yeah. life, like you said. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, it's, it's great. I mean, um, especially once you start applying the integration is supposed to be fun. Like I want to tell yeah. people like, I listen, I totally get it. You know, sometimes um, people want to do it more and more times. And I only did both those experiences as isolated one-time experiences. I know some people need it. I think it's more, great. You know, I, and I get it. I think everybody needs to do whatever makes the most sense for them. Right. But the integration is actually supposed to be fun. Like take what you just learned. Same with like reading, like mm -hmm. take what you learn and just practice it. It's an interesting thing to see how to connect the dots and how it just starts to just basically create your life, even in a whole mm -hmm. different way than what we sometimes get used to, right? Yeah, we're able to be more intentional with this dream state. And it's uh, it can be very, very fun, right? Uh, yeah. Once you start seeing all the uh, synchronicities, and I think this was on the last podcast I did where um, he mentioned, you know, with the first stage is moving from, why this happened to me to why did this happen mm -hmm. for me? And then the next stage is it's happening through me. And that I was like, Oh, wow. Cause we always hear in these type of circles about like happening for you. Like that's pretty common. Yeah. I was like, Oh, happening through me. Yeah. And I'm like, yes, that resonates because I remember at least in 2020, that was like the big year of integration for me. And I was in like this little mastermind, just some friends together. And you know, one of the girls were, was like, you always have like these amazing synchronicities. And I was like, isn't this just normal? And then I started to realize like, Oh man. And just kind of to your point too, with these soul contracts, uh, last summer, yeah. almost a year ago, I got T-boned by a tractor on a country road and my first, which was a gnarly story in itself, but my first reaction, like it felt like a highly spiritual moment. And I was like, what's the lesson here? And I could just, I already went straight to like the contract with him and me. And I remember getting out of my car and walking to the side, seeing the damage that I looked at. And I heard this voice that was like, you're supposed to say what the fuck. So I go, what the fuck? And then I was like, no, I'm not. And I was like, and then I went back to like the Zen self and I was like, whoa, there's something it like, it turned into this really like highly spiritual moment that just a couple of years before that I would have been furious and pissed and like been right. distracted in the game of life, you know? So yeah, it, it, it can be so easy to get, angry or to get, you know, upset or, um, you know, what I heard, and I've said this before, I think on a podcast, maybe even my own, I, and I love it, you know, Bruce Lee, uh, many, many years ago, obviously, was in an interview, and he was talking about feeling what you feel the moment of impact, right? Mm -hmm. Whether you're being attacked, like physically, because you're talking about fighting, obviously, as a fighter, um, or mentally. And when something comes at you, we'll just use what he was saying for like, in terms of fighting um, mentally or physically, but in case of mental, if you can practice in that moment, what, like, what do you feel in that actual moment? But like before you react, mm -hmm. what do you feel? Why? Like, and if you can understand it, then you can start to eventually respond accordingly faster and faster and not with the same energy that was inflicted onto you, but with new energy from understanding, right? Because most of the time, what, do we, what, do, what, what happens is cause and effect, something happens and you react, right? That's what just people mm -hmm. do. And so, and I think that <laughs> we're seeing that in the macro as well, <laughs> you know, right. globally. Um, and so, and it just riles things up and keeps it in a spiral, right? Versus like, if something comes at you and you can just kind of like, almost kind of pause it, 
because what you're doing is like you're in, you're internally checking in and like getting all the points, getting all the, you know, the working past the narratives, working past everything, but like what's happening? What am I understanding? What am I feeling? Is there something greater going on in this exact moment? Like what is happening? And then if we can understand, if we practice it enough, we get so fast at it that after a while we can respond even before it probably happens. Mm. That's how he was able to start like moving so crazily. People were like, how do you move before it even happens? And he, this is kind of what he was basically explaining, right? Because it's like, well, after a while you get so good internally knowing, you know, um, from a soulful place, you can almost predict what's going to happen. And because you're, you know, you're practicing knowing, you know? And so I, I like the idea of that, um, you know, yeah, part of us wants to react right away. Like, what the fuck? Like, how did this just happen? Right. The other part of us is like, what's going on? What do I need to be aware of? What, like, you know, do I need to slow down? Did I, was I not present? Did I miss something? And if by being in this position right here with this particular time and this farmer or this, you know, uh, tractor or whatever with this, where am I being kept from? Or what is helping me that it could have been much worse? Like, what are all the dots I don't see yet that I haven't connected? Let me zoom out and not, you know, um, be a victim I, of what happened to me, but instead be more of like an observer of what, what's happening. I got a fun I mean? one for you, which thank you for sharing that. And that makes me think of the 90 second rule. Are you familiar with that? Uh, the 90 second rule? Uh, yeah, it's not that well known, uh, but basically it takes your body 90 seconds to have a physiological response, yes. a chemical response to something that happens. And then after that, we're stuck in a loop. So real quick, uh, I was just in Orlando and I've always wanted to go on a wakeboard cable park, like a, a cable system that takes you around in a circle with jumps and things like that. And the main one was close. Or the first system went down. Then the second one went down. And I, I had that same kind of response. I was like, well, I, I think I was probably going to get hurt. You know, like that just kind of came through. So it was supposed to be broken so I wouldn't get hurt. And I'm like, well, okay, I still want to do it. So I, I found another one. I was like, okay, I think I'm going to go this place. And then like everything in my body kind of told me not to go. And I did, to your point, earlier when you're talking about like do the thing i was at a conference and i was like yeah i know i'm supposed uh, i should be here and i felt kind of guilty so i went to one of the sessions and i was like yeah this doesn't feel right though i'm going to the cable park and on the uber ride there i was like i just started to have like not visions but more like a, a clear cognizance like a knowing it felt like oh yeah you're going to try to go on a slider and you're going to um face plant and slider and you know get fuck, fucked up essentially and i go no that's the adversary so i'm going like back and forth on this and this all comes kind of full circle to everything you're talking about because i did a full a few laps around the cables system before I actually went on any of the sliders and I'm not a, a snowboarder. I've snowboarded, but I don't go to the park and wakeboarding. I've always been behind a boat. So for me going on like a slider or jump, I'm not a skater. It's like, eh, that's a little like scary. Right. So we were talking about this earlier and like doing the thing. So I remember the first time I went up on like the little slider, it was, um, it was like one of those moments, almost like when I used to do triathlons, like doing doing the uncomfortable thing and just being like, okay, confidence, I'm not going to have fear. And then you go through it and then you start to get more comfortable. Next thing you know, I'm going off this, uh, the kickers or whatever they're called, the ramps, and I'm doing grabs and things like that and landing them. And I'm like, damn, this is fun, right? And it was just like this whole real interesting mm -hmm way to be in my head with the different parts like ifs like internal family systems and just listen to yeah. the different parts and protectors you know but it's amazing it's amazing how our gut intuition kicks in our body kicks in our mind kicks in you know when we're in the act of doing versus mm -hmm. everything else we could be thinking about True. We could be thinking things, we could be feeling things, but then when you're, you know, look how present you were when you were doing it and how like you just kind of flowed, you just knew what to do. But prior to that, you had all kinds of different thoughts about it one way or the other, you know. 
Oh man, it's so easy to get lost in the mind. But we're about at time, unfortunately. And I knew I, I could have gone, uh, <laughs> brought that stuff up a little bit earlier, but it was such a good conversation and really talking about spirituality and business. And thank you for just scratching the surface on a little of your personal stories and transformation and medicine work. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, no, thank you for having me on. I'm happy to talk about the stuff. I'm sure we could probably do a million podcasts. <laughs> so, you know, happy to talk about this stuff anytime. Down. We'll definitely be doing more. Um, be doing more. I definitely came from the South, huh? So <laughs> anyways, uh, yeah, guys, check out Matt's work. I have links to his website, his Instagram, his podcast. And I believe you have a book coming out, right? I'm working on it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, it's, uh, if you go to like mattgosman.com forward slash book, uh, there's like a waiting list there. Um, finally just committing to it. Um, <laughs> after my audience has been on my ass for like, uh, pretty much the entire time since launching like eight, nine years ago. Um, mm -hmm. but I finally just, the, the calling is, is too strong at this point. Um, and it just feels really, really, really right. All, all of the things feel really right about it. So it's cool. been flowing every day, writing more of it and it's coming together nicely. So nice. Yeah. Yeah. Happy for you. That's a Thank fun you. journey. Well, cool. Thank you so much, Matt. And we'll talk again soon. Thank you guys for listening to this episode. Thank you guys.